The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Leading Change, Leading Advances in CLL Care, Guidance on Delivering Modern Targeted and Cellular Therapeutics. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash AZG860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So this morning, we're going to be presenting Leading Change and Leading Advances in CLL Care, Guidance on Delivering Modern Targeted and Cellular Therapeutics. My name is Laura Zatella. I am a nurse practitioner at the University of California, San Francisco, and I am delighted to be joined by my esteemed colleagues, Christina Rosamano and uh, Kristen Battiato. Let's start with a little bit of basics. Where do we stand with CLL in 2022? There are an estimated 18,740 cases for 2023, leading to 4,400 deaths. The median age at diagnosis is 70 years, so we know that this is the disease that uh, most often occurs in older patients. And it's important to keep in mind that CLL and SLL are considered to be identical diseases. And the way I think about it is that it's called, it's, it's, it's from, it originates from the same cell, but it's called CLL if it's found predominantly in the bone marrow in the blood, and it's called SLL, small lymphocytic um, lymphoma, if it's found predominantly in the lymph nodes. It's treated exactly the same way, and the five-year relative survival rate for adults with CLL is 88%. And that is a pretty significant survival rate for someone who has a malignancy because although this is often an incurable illness, it is highly treatable. And we're going to talk about a lot of the modern therapies that we use to treat the disease this morning. So starting with like an overview of the, the current landscape in CLL, it's changed dramatically over um, the last few years where patients are no longer routinely treated with chemotherapy and are routinely treated with targeted therapy. So we have a number of agents that are BTK inhibitors, brutinib, um, which was first in class, and then newer second-generation agents, um, calibrutinib and xanabrutinib, which are a little bit more selective and have a more favorable side effect profile um, than a brutinib. These are um, all approved for CLL and SLL. Then we have a BCL2 um, inhibitor, a venetoclax, uh, which is also approved uh, for CLL. And we have some newer agents that are right around the corner. Now, both of these BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors inhibit um, the B cell uh, growth pathway. And this is a very important mechanism of action because of course um, CLL is a malignancy of B lymphocytes. So what's up and coming are um, new BTK inhibitors with a slightly different mechanism of action, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, um, pertabrutinib and nemtabrutinib. And pertabrutinib is already now approved for mantle cell lymphoma and we're expecting the approval in CLL very soon. So looking at the different um, targeted options and what the practice guidelines show, um, historically, we look at a number of different uh, prognostic factors, like, and one of the mo more important ones is 17P uh, deletion. And for, pac for patients who have CLL that carry the 17P deletion and for CLL that doesn't have the 17P deletion, all of these targeted agents are effective in both settings. And then after first-line therapy, what we expect is that um, patients will enjoy a prolonged remission, but ultimately the um, CLL will relapse. And then we have a number of second-line therapies. And as you can see, they look very similar to the first-line therapies, and we're going to talk about how you can sometimes either retreat with the same, um, with the same medication 
or you can opt to use a different targeted agent than you used in the first line. So for example, if you start with a BTK inhibitor and there is a relapse later on, you can consider using a BCL2 inhibitor like venetoclax. So despite all of these advances, the real world data shows that work needs to be done. So there was a study looking at how the actual tra treatments that patients received between 2013 and 2021. And there has been a significant shift where, like in our practices, all patients are being treated with targeted therapy now. But in, in this study, it's showed that there's still a significant number of patients throughout the United States that are being treated with chemotherapy or single agent rituximab, which is not the standard of care at this time. So we know that um, we have so many effective therapies and one of our, the most important roles that we play is effective symptom management. How do we help patients feel as well as possible while they're on these therapies to live as long as possible. And so prompt identification of adverse events and uh, monitoring and treatment of symptoms is really important. And I think that's where we play a very special and unique role. So the most common adverse events that are seen in this setting are infection, um, bleeding, and diarrhea. We know that it takes a village to take care of patients, and we have a lot of um, different roles on the healthcare team, the hematologist, oncologist, the advanced practice provider, the pharmacist, and pharmacists are especially important in CLL um, since these are oral medications and often need, to be, often need to be ordered through a specialty pharmacy. There's drug-to-drug -drug interactions that pharmacists um, can help us identify. We also have um, social workers that provide social support, and then of course the oncology nurse. And the oncology nurse is really integral in the team in patient education, teaching patients what symptoms to report, what side effects to expect, um, managing those symptoms, giving them tips, counseling on the treatment expectations. We're gonna talk a little bit about the logistics of the, of uh, the targeted therapies and how we make the choice of using one over the other and how we talk to patients. And there's a lot of shared decision making because you're going to see that there's not always a right answer. And then um, finally, connecting patients with the really important resources that are available to help support them. So the CLL Society is an excellent resource for healthcare professionals, patients, and caregivers. So they put on educational programs such as this one, but they also have an incredible, um, incredible resource on their website for patients, such as patient education materials that you can print off and give to the patients about the different medications. They have some really innovative programs, like getting a second opinion. Patients can contact the CLL Society um, and get a second opinion from a leading expert in the field, which is a really incredible resource, especially if um, patients are being treated in the community by a general oncologist, to have that second opinion can be um, really reassuring to them. There's um, also an expert access program where patients can ask questions and CLL experts um, from across the country will um, give them advice. So I encourage you to look at these resources. There's a QR code and, um, and the website on this slide. So the most important person on the team, of course, is the patient. And so we wanted to bring a patient into um, our presentation this morning. And we're going to do this through a video. So I would like to, um, to share this video of the patient voice, um, this is Terry Evans, who's going to share his experience as a patient and advocate. My name is Terry Evans, and I was diagnosed with CLL 22 years ago in 2000. At the time of my diagnosis, the, the, there were really only two options for treatment. One was chemotherapy, and the other one was transplant. When I finally needed treatment in 2007, the treatment options really had not changed, so my first-line treatment happened to be FCR or chemotherapy. 
This began my next 15 years of treatments. I've had over seven different treatment protocols, several of them more than once. The advancements in the treatment for CLL has been nothing short of amazing in the last 10 years, where I was extremely limited in my choices for treatment. Now patients have choices of several very viable options, depending on their age and their health status and the type of treatment they would be comfortable with, they can now choose from continuous treatment that keeps their disease stable or a fixed duration treatment. Both of these options have shown long-lasting remissions in the frontline setting. There are also now trials comparing various combinations of covalent BTK inhibitors, venetoclax and obinutuzumab that will hopefully give patients even longer lasting remissions. Patients should not neglect looking into clinical trials. I personally have been on three and I don't regret being on any of them. If you relapse on a BTK inhibitor, you can move to a BCL2 inhibitor and vice versa. If a covalent BTK inhibitor is used in the front line, there are generally two reasons to discontinue therapy. If the reason for stopping is because of disease progression, then moving to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, which are currently in clinical trials, may be an option. Clearly, one of the biggest unmet needs for CLL patients is if you are double refractory to both a covalent BTK inhibitor and a BCL2 inhibitor. This is an area where non-covalent BTK inhibitors and possibly CAR-T may be an option for the patient. What has been invaluable to me in my journey with CLL are the resources that are available through the CLL Society. Whether a patient is interested in just learning more about CLL or joining one of the over 40 CLL specific support groups, all that information is available on the website at CLLsociety.org. This website has sections for newly diagnosed patients, for the types of treatments that are available, what tests should be run and when they are necessary and unnecessary. I wish this resource were available to me when I was first diagnosed. Patients need to learn about what their treatment options are, if their status changes to needing treatment, or if they have relapsed on their current treatment. I am a 22-year CLL patient and survivor. I have some of the worst prognostic markers. Without these new treatments, I would not be alive today. Every time I needed a treatment, there was an option available to me. I have long ago realized that I may just be kicking the can down the road, but so far there's no end to that road in sight. Thank you. So our goals for today is to help you understand the evidence um, that supports established and emerging therapies for the management of patients with CLL and equip you with the skills that you need to integrate these targeted therapies and other options into personalized management plans for patients with CLL. So I think by the end of this session, um, we hope to increase your confidence in being able to counsel patients who have CLL um, on their disease, the prognosis, the difference between um, the agent classes and the um, efficacy and the safety expectations. And hopefully you're going to find some practical guidance, um, such as dosing, scheduling, care coordination, monitoring, and managing the um, adverse events. So with that, I would like to um, turn it over to my colleague, Christina, who's going to talk to us about covalent um, BTK inhibitors. Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Uh, before I get into the first slide, um, I just want to make mention that the BTK inhibitors are oral therapy. So again, as Laura said, game changer. As of 10 years ago, the only option for these patients was chemoimmunotherapy. And a lot of patients did pretty poorly with this. So when the BTK inhibitors came along, it was a game changer for the CLL patients. So this slide here kind of looks at the efficacy of continuous BTKI therapy. So to prove efficacy, we have to take the standard, which was chemoimmunotherapy, and then compare. 
So each one of these studies compared a BTK inhibitor with some form of chemoimmunotherapy. And across the board, there was a progression-free survival benefit with the BTK inhibitors. For an example, with the Alliance study, of 48-month PFS estimates were 76% for abrutinib versus 47% for bendamustine rituxan. So even any patient looking at that is going to think that's significant. Also in these studies, they proved that these patients that had these riskier um, or ad adverse uh, genetics were, um, they actually had extended PFS as well, which they did not with most chemotherapy. And so I know we talked with Laura a little bit about deletion 17P, and we're going to kind of hone in on that as a poor um, prognostic factor. And these patients even had, even in these studies, they had improvement in their PFS. So TP53 and 17P mutated and or deleted, again, adverse risk factor for these patients, IGHV status unmutated. And I'm going to kind of, for the purposes here, I'm going to kind of group those two together. So what does it mean that it's an adverse risk factor? So basically, this means that these patients have more aggressive disease, they have shorter time to therapy, they don't respond as well, they have shorter periods of time between therapy. Uh, also, we look at beta, beta 2 microglobulin greater than 3.5, uh, higher clinical stage, and age. And age greater than 65, this is mostly because these patients have mo more comorbidities once they hit 65 and above. There is no role for chemoimmunotherapy in deletion PCLL. Uh, so what is the efficacy of BTKs in deletion 17 PCLL? So back to these same studies again. If you look at the center line, it shows how many patients with deletion 17P and or TP53 mutation were included. And again, there was a PFS benefit for these patients, as I said a little bit earlier. So some of these, they didn't even reach a median PFS. So the CLL Society does encourage patients to obtain biomarker testing before receiving treatment. And I sit up here from a major medical center, and this to me is, of course, like, it's, it's expected, it's normal, it's what we do all the time. But is it in the community and other places? Maybe not. And some of these patients are unaware of certain tests that should be done before they receive treatment or even when they're moving on to a second line of therapy. And so what the CLL Society did was they put together a test before treat campaign, which basically educates the patients and then empowers these patients to go to their providers and say, oh, I didn't have this testing done, can you do it? Or, oh, did I have it done? Can you sit and explain what this means to me? because we use these, these results to guide therapy. And so these patients want to know more about their specific CLL. And so if we look at the test before treat, and again, you can also use this QR code to pull it up. Uh, they, so we test FISH and TP53 mutation before every treatment. And this is because it can change after you, you receive therapy. We test IGVH mutation status before the first treatment. No need to retest that, that does not change. And then deletion 17P, TP53 mutation, no chemotherapy. And I can kind of summarize the rest by saying no chemotherapy. The reason that IGVH mutated says possible FCR is because there is a subset of patients with great prognostic features. So they have a mutated IGVH and a 13Q deletion. And these patients actually can respond to FCR. And we have some patients 10, 15, 20 years out who are still have a durable remission from this regimen. So we do have to mention it. So dosing of our covalent BTKs. So we have three now in CLL. So first to market abrutinib, 420 milligrams once daily. Uh, this does differ from mantle cell lymphoma dosing, which is 560 milligrams. Uh, Imbruvica has the most dosage forms available. Acalabrutinib, 100 milligrams twice daily in tablet formulation, or xanabrutinib, which can be given either 160 milligrams twice daily or 320 milligrams once daily, and those are in capsules. So when we're starting therapy on this pa these patients, we obviously need to review dosing with them, let them know how they're supposed to take these drugs. And this is a little bit complicated, this slide, but what this is basically telling us is that there are interactions with these drugs and other drugs. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're checking drug interactions. And we're all nurses, and this is what we do. So this is not new for us. So when you're going to start therapy, you'll run drug interactions. You'll make sure there's nothing that's going to be a significant issue. Every time that patient comes back in the room, and tells you that, oh, my cardiologist started a new med, my psychiatrist, you're going to, again, check, because you're not going to rely on that other provider to have checked for you. There is a dosing and drug interaction information is available as a downloadable practice aid. So if you want to keep this for reference, 
So what are the possible AEs that may arise with the BTK inhibitor? So these are kind of class, it's a class effect, right? So we talk about these in regards to all the BTK inhibitors, um, and you're going to go through these with your patient. So atrial fibrillation, obviously a cardiac arrhythmia, one of the ones that will concern them the most when you mention it. Um, you really want to make sure your patients are aware of the possible signs and symptoms of atrial fibrillation so they can possibly identify and seek help if they need it. Some will be like, my Apple Watch now told me I'm an AFib. That's new. So, you know, they, they have some hint there. Or they'll come into the office, you'll do an exam, and you find the AFib, and they're completely asymptomatic. Arthralgia is one of the more difficult to actually manage. Um, joint pain, but I can also group in here myalgias, right? Some of these patients have muscle pain and muscle cramping as well. Higher risk of infection. These patients are already at a really high risk for infection, and now we're adding some therapy, so we have to be really cautious. And we know the sinopulmonary infections are what really plague our CLL patients. Diarrhea. I personally do not see this that often, but I do educate patients that when you start the therapy, you might have some. A few instances is fine. Try to hydrate. But if it's persistent diarrhea, I need to know about it. Hypertension, another one that will concern your patients and usually a side effect that comes along a little longer into therapy. But you have to tell these patients, you might need an antihypertensive at some point in your treatment. Um, if they're already on antihypertensives, they might need to increase their dose or start a second agent. You just want to prepare them for this. And some of them have cardiologists, and you can work in conjunction with them. Bleeding risk, so we know these drugs thin the blood. They act a little bit like an aspirin, so higher risk of bleeding for these patients. Um, you want to warn them they'll have easier bruising. They might have some petechiae. Um, we want to know before any invasive procedures they're going to have because we need to guide them on when to hold the drug and when to restart, right? So we mitigate bleeding risk for these patients. Um, obviously, the other thing we usually mention is if there's any significant trauma, you obviously need to be examined. Uh, derm changes, so um, you can get some rashes, but really the, the thing patients complain most about are brittle and um, frail nails and thinning or some hair loss. And that's where we usually look at the derm. Uh, fatigue, difficult because some of these patients are going in fatigued, like they're anemic. And then what I usually say is sometimes the fatigue can worsen before it improves, and it should get better with time on therapy. Ventricular arrhythmias, these are rare. You do have to mention they could occur. And cytopenias, and as we all do, we will measure CBC. We will monitor CBCs. So what are the implications of BTK inhibitors? Um, selectivity for off-target effects. So basically what this slide is showing is that first to market abrutinib was the least selective of all the drugs, right? So it hit more off-target effects, and therefore it has a poorer side effect profile. The newer second-generation drugs, the calibrutinib and zanabrutinib, they perfected this a little bit, and so now they hit less off-target effects, and therefore they have a better side effect profile. They're, they're better tolerated by the patients. There were head-to-head -head trials uh, that went on to compare the second generations like a calibrutinib to, you know, the initial abrutinib. Um, and as you can see, this is pretty significant data. So this is median follow-up of about 41 months. So AFib, A-flutter, 9.4% in a calibrutinib versus 16% in abrutinib, 9.4% uh, hypertension versus 23% in abrutinib, and again, bleeding risk as well. 38% in um, calibrutinib versus 51% in abrutinib. So this is pretty significant difference. Also, Alpine study looked at zanabrutinib, our other second generation. Uh, in their safety analysis, it was noted 5.2% had AFib A flutter with zanabrutinib versus 13.3% abrutinib. So our general safety considerations with BTKs, and again, this might be repetitive, but it's so important. Bleeding, we're going to monitor for bleeding. We're going to um, notify the patients of what to watch out for. A lot of these patients are on anticoagulation. That's OK. It does not mean you cannot be on a BTK inhibitor. We just need to monitor you closely. Uh, we really want to try to avoid warfarin. It's just too, it's, it's annoying to actually manage warfarin at baseline and now add this in. Um, and then we want to let the patients know, of course, notify us when you're going to have a procedure, notify us of any bleeding. Infections, monitor, patients call you know, um, evaluate them promptly. Obviously, you want to get on top of infections. Cardiovascular events, evaluate your cardiac history. Do they have any, side of, do they have any medications they're taking normally? Uh, and I know a lot of us, um, before we start this therapy, will do some kind of cardiac evaluation. Commonly in the practice I'm in, we do echocardiograms. We want to see where we're starting, right? We want to make sure everything's okay. Um, we're going to teach these patients to monitor for arrhythmias. We'll monitor. 
Hypertension, patients should monitor blood pressure, we'll monitor visits, manage with antihypertensives, and cytopenias, we will check your blood counts. So I talked about kind of the class side effects, but the second generations have some specifics. So a calibrutinib, um, there is a possible side effect of these headaches. They commonly occur earlier in therapy with a calibrutinib and typically resolve in one to two months. And we manage these with Tylenol and caffeine, which is very, very effective. Um, I, I don't know a single patient that's had to come off this drug for headaches, but sometimes you do have to provide some emotional support to get them through. Um, we mentioned caution with ibuprofen and NSAIDs due to increase, increased risk of bleeding. That said, I just told you, you can be on an anticoagulant. So this is just a caution. We don't want them taking 800 of ibuprofen every two hours. Xanabrutinib, um, there's a risk for neutropenia, more so than with the others. Um, and so, of course, we don't want our patients neutropenic. Um, how this is managed in practices is a little different, so nothing is wrong, but in the practice I'm in, we usually start with some growth factor. We'll give them, and see, we'll see if, was this a one-off, can we boost them up and move along? Obviously, if they have persistent neutropenia, we're going to have to evaluate. You don't want to live on growth factor, and you don't want to live neutropenic. So at that point in time, you might have to stop the drug for a period of time and let the patient recover, or you might have to actually consider dose reduction. So what are our take-homes on continuous BTK therapy? Before starting BTK therapy, we're gonna fully evaluate our patient. We're nurses, this is what we do. We'll assess for comorbidities. We'll evaluate their risk factors. We'll talk them through if they don't understand. We can kind of talk to them about why we picked the therapy we did. Educate on dosing and the expected AE profile, which we just did. Watch for intolerance. So. We really do try to get our patients through these side effects, right? We're gonna try everything in our power to get them through before we consider changing. So the thing is, if you're on a brutinib, which is the first generation with the poor side effect profile, and you've tried every option, you can't help them through their side effect, you can actually switch to a more selective covalent BTK and see if that helps to mitigate the side effects. And we're gonna be prepared for multidisciplinary collaboration. So these patients have other providers, we need to work together, especially cardio-oncology, dermatology, pulmonology, All right? So we have to just work as a team. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kristen, who will talk about non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for getting up with the, at the crack of dawn with us. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about non-covalent BTK inhibitors and how nurses can prepare. So with covalent BTK inhibitors, resistance mutations are the major driver of progression in CLL. The BTK cis-41 mutation is a, is a dominant reason for progressive CLL in patients receiving BTK therapy with covalent BTK inhibitors. And we've seen that patients who've acquired a brutinib resistance, the majority of them have had mutations in BTK and PLCG2. Um, let's define double refractory disease. This is an, uh, an unmet need in our patient population as they continue to live longer and, and proceed through more and more therapies. So the proposed criteria for defining a double refractory CLL patient is as a patient treated with a BTKI and venetoclax-based therapy in any line of therapy. They've had clinical progression while on a BTK inhibitor. They've had clinical progression while on venetoclax within 24 months after venetoclax discontinuation or being resistant to treatment with venetoclax, with a venetoclax regimen. Double refractory patients are a subset of double exposed patients and have a very poor prognosis and, and, uh, and suboptimal standard of care options at, at this time. The median time to discontinuation of the next line of therapy or death was about 5.5 months for this patient population. Non-covalent BTK inhibitors can overcome BTK resistance. So covalent BTK inhibitors, like we just spoke about, abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, bind to BTK via the cis-481 binding site. If this site mutates, the covalent BTK inhibitors can no longer bind to BTK, and the patient will eventually have disease progression. Pertabrutinib is a new non-covalent BTK inhibitor and is a very, a very exciting drug. It's non-covalent and does not rely on cis-481 to bind to BTK. Therefore, it can overcome the cis-41 resistance, and patients can have clinical response on pertabrutinib, despite the cis-41 mutation. The covalent BTK pertabrutinib is highly active in BTK-pretreated relapse refractory CLL-SLL patients per the Bruin trial. 
there was an overall response rate of 82.2% in BTK, BTKI pretreated patients with CLL and SLL. The median progression-free survival was 19.6 months, and there was durable efficacy regardless of the CIS-41 mutation status. Pertibrutinib is also effective in patients with prior exposure to both BTKA, BTKI and BCL2 inhibitor therapy. The overall response rate was 79% in BTKI, BCL2 pretreated patients with CLL, SLL. And the median progression-free survival was 16.8 months in patients with double exposed disease. Pertibrutinib also has a really phenomenal AE profile. The most common grade three AE we've seen was neutropenia, which can be easily managed with growth factor support. I also wanna highlight this is a BTK inhibitor, so you're gonna be looking at for those BTK classic, uh, classic class side effects, and they include bruising, rash, arthralgia, hemorrhage, hematoma, hypertension, atrial fib, and atrial flutter. I do wanna highlight there's a very favorable cardiac pro profile with this, with this medication, only 2.3% of patients developed grade three or higher hypertension, and 1.2% developed atrial fib in a flutter. Non-covalent BTKI dosing and safety. So based on the mantle cell label and experience in the CLL-SLL Bruin trial, the, the dosing is 200 milligrams once a day. Um, we wanna make sure you're monitoring for arrhythmias, infections, bleeding, and cytopenias, and look for any potential drug interactions. You wanna avoid strong CYP3 and 4 inhibitors, and if, uh, unless absolutely necessary, then you wanna consider a dose reduction. And you also wanna avoid strong, did I go out? Okay, strong, there you are. <laughs> strong to moderate CYP3 and 4 inducers. Um, if unavoidable, you'll have to consider a dose increase. So here are the major ongoing trials of non-covalent BTK inhibitors that are open to enrollment at this time. I want to highlight the Bruin CLL322 trial, which we're, we're currently enrolling at both Columbia and MSK at this time. It's, it's pairing pertubrutinib with venetoclax and rituximab versus venetoclax rituximab in previously treated CLL SLL patients. The CLL Society can be very helpful in helping us navigate patient, helping patients navigate clinical trials. They provide guidance on how to understand the importance of clinical trials and navigate, navigate clinicaltrials.gov. It provides step-by-step -step guidance on searching for all available clinical trials with those of SLL and CLL. And you can learn more if you scan this QR code. So nurse take-homes on preparing for non-covalent BTKI. Resistance to covalent BTK inhibitors is one of the drivers of progressive disease and treatment discontinuation. Patients with double refractory CLL historically have had very poor outcomes, and this non-covalent BTK class represents a significant contribution to CLL care can overcome BTK resistance and are effective in treating double refractory disease. It's still investigational, but open via trial enrollment at this time. Pertubertinib is, is approved in mantle cell lymphoma and off-label use may be a possibility. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Laura. Okay, so we are going to talk a little bit now about fixed duration platforms. So we, we spent some time talking about the continuous treatment with BTK inhibitors, would be, which is taking oral medications every day. We have some options now where patients can have time-limited therapy. Um, and so I, um, I want to start this section with that. So this is... This is where shared decision-making is really important and where we have a lot of long discussions with patients about the potential benefits and the side effects profile of the available options. So the one option can be taking um, you know, pills every day indefinitely. Um, other options can be these fixed duration um, therapies. And the most Common fixed duration therapy, the one that's approved right now, is venetoclax and abinituzumab, which is a year long of therapy and can um, provide a very prolonged progression free survival and the possibility of undetectable minimal residual disease. So you can get a deeper remission with um, these fixed duration regimens than you can get with the oral continuous BTK um, inhibitors. But it's very different, the logistics. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because obinituzumab and venetoclax regimen is very time intensive when it first starts. 
Um, there are frequent visits, sometimes a couple times a week for tumor lysis monitoring um, versus the BTK inhibitors where once um, patient starts therapy, you can check labs like weekly at first, ultimately monthly, and then after they've been on it for years and they're totally stable, you can often only check like, every three months. So there are a lot of considerations. There's consideration if a patient is um, close to an infusion center, if you're seeing someone as a second opinion and, and they don't have um, an infusion center that's comfortable giving a, a benetuzumab, which um, carries a risk of infusion reaction. Um, so there's a lot of things, and, and these are the conversations that we're having with patients to decide what is the most appropriate. And um, Christina also mentioned the importance of looking at comorbidities. So sometimes there are other medical problems will also influence our decision about the um, initial treatment. But I think one other important point that we're going to touch on is like it is nice having options because even if it, like no matter what option a patient starts with, whether they start with a BTK inhibitor or a fixed duration regimen, um, they will we expect they'll enjoy some time in remission, but ultimately there will be a relapse and then we can always move to a different class of agents. So over time, um, especially as our patient Terry pointed out, um, patients will ultimately probably be on every um, class if they're eligible for it. So just to review the evidence we have for the fixed duration regimens, it was the CLL-14 trial that looked at patients who were over the age of 70 and had comorbidities. And um, as Christina said, like historically chemotherapy was the standard of care. So a lot of these trials that we presented are comparing the newer agents against chemotherapy. The current clinical trials are not doing that, um, but this CLL-14 trial looked at venetoclax and abinutuzumab um, versus chlorambucil and abinutuzumab in, um, in first-line therapy for CLL. And there is a significant uh, progression-free survival benefit that you can see 62% uh, versus 27%. So that was really significant that the majority of patients will still be in remission at five years um, after this treatment, knowing that this treatment is only given for one year. And so they remain um, off therapy in remission. The other important um, data from this study is that you can look for minimal residual disease. And in, in CLL, there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, but one of the ways that you can do it is um, through a special flow cytometry or using next generation sequencing. Um, to identify a specific DNA sequence that is only specific for the CLL cells. Um, and using this, you, you can check it at baseline, and then you can check it again um, after therapy. And what they saw in this study is that three months after the end of treatment, there was a significant rate of completely undetectable um, disease. And some of these measures, this shows you um, looking at one in 10 to the negative four. But we use even more sensitive MRD testing now that can test for like one in 100,000 or one in a million cells in the body. And we're seeing very high rates of minimal residual disease. So these, uh, this regimen is extremely effective. Another fixed duration Venetoclax platform was the Murano trial. And this was a trial um, with, that enrolled patients who had relapsed CLL and used venetoclax and rituximab. And um, again, there was a sustained uh, progression free survival using the venetoclax and rituximab um, versus rituximab and bendamustine um, chemotherapy. And uh, what's interesting about this is this was, this trial was, uh, was done first and in this trial, they started with venetoclax and then um, did rituximab, so they did a venetoclax ramp up first. And what we learned from this is that it is easier to start with 
when you have a doublet with venetoclax, it's easier to start with the other agent first, and that decreases the risk of tumor lysis. So with venetoclax and abinutuzumab, you start with abinutuzumab first, and then you um, bring in the venetoclax on day 22. And that has made it a lot easier to manage tumor lysis. So this is the schema of the venetoclax dosing and administration, and this is um, really important. It is complicated, well, I shouldn't say it's all that complicated, um, but it is complicated to like put together the calendar um, and make sure patients understand it. The way that the medication comes is very easy to use, and it's really nice. You can see the pictures here. Um, in the starter pack, patients actually will just get week one, and it's you open up the package and you just take the pills that are in there for week one, and then for week two, week three, week four, so it's very patient-friendly, and that part is easy to understand. Um, what's complicated is from our point of view is before you start venetoclax, it is extraordinarily important to assess for the risk of tumor lysis. And based on the risk, if there's a very high risk, patients need to be admitted. If there's a low or intermediate risk, then um, we can treat as an outpatient. Um, and in a couple slides, I'm going to talk about some of the other things that you do but there's coordination of checking the labs, and um, especially with the 20 milligram and the 50 milligram ramp up. So after this ramp up has been completed, then the standard dose is 400 milligrams um, a day. So just like with the BTK inhibitors, there are drug-to-drug -drug interactions with venetoclax, and um, you can see that it's important to avoid strong CYP3A inhibitors. Um, if they do need to be used, there is a dose adjustment required. So one of the um, unique adverse events with venetoclax is neutropenia, and um, with neutropenia, again, there are guidelines on how to manage it, but there's also some clinician preference in there. So you could uh, interrupt the dose for a couple of days and then restart. You could interrupt the dose and give um, growth factor. You could try to give growth factor and treat through. It just sort of depends um, on the patient, on the situation, where they are in the ramp up. So for tumor lysis monitoring, there's really good guidelines on how you determine the risk, if it's low, intermediate, or high risk. And you can see on this slide here, it really, the important thing is the level of tumor involvement. And so it, what is important to know is the size of the lymph nodes and the absolute lymphocyte count, because that is going to inform us about the risk of tumor lysis, and we'll be able to um, stratify. So again, high-risk patients do need to be admitted for um, IV, IV fluids and um, intense monitoring. The low-risk patients, though, that we see outpatient, we can check labs the day before they take the dose, the day that they take the dose, six to eight hours after the dose, and then the day after they take the dose. And this is done for the, at least for the first two weeks for the 20 milligram and the 50 milligram ramp up. In addition to that, patients need to be on allopurinol um, for uh, prevention of hyperuricemia. And if, um, if patients are at high risk and they have an elevated uh, uric acid to start with, rispericase can also be um, an, an, an option. And then lastly, it's important to counsel patients to um, be well hydrated. They need to be drinking at least two liters of fluid a day. So other um, adverse events that we see are GI um, events. There can be nausea or diarrhea. Um, there can be infection. Upper respiratory is, mo is the most common. Um, sometimes we also see a cough that's a non-infectious cough that is related to venetoclax. Um, rarely there is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia and it can cause um, joint pain. 
Okay, so um, moving into what's up and coming, this is not approved right now, but I wanted to let you know that this is on the horizon. Um, there was a Captivate trial where they looked at combining abrutinib, so a BTK inhibitor with Benetoclex, um, to see if, if it was possible to do a time-defined therapy using both of these agents up front. And this strategy achieved um, durable responses, a clini clinically meaningful progression-free survival, and treatment-free remissions. So this was nice because it was a fixed duration of therapy, and it still achieved um, prolonged remissions. And again, just like with the other studies, um, it, was, it was effective in the high-risk groups, um, like patients who have um, CLL with the deletion 17P. Now, um, we talked a lot about tumor lysis of venetoclax, so the way this trial was designed is it was designed where you start with abrutinib first and you do three months of abrutinib to lead in. And that effectively um, cytoreduced the level of CLL and reduced the severity of tumor lysis syndrome. The most common um, high-grade adverse events were neutropenia and hypertension, um, but overall it was it was fairly well tolerated. I think what's important is it was highly effective, but now you have to look at the side effect profile for a BTK inhibitor and the side effect profile of venetoclax. So certainly with any doublet, there is going to be um, a more significant safety profile. So what does this mean for us? How are we gonna prepare for the novel combinations? Um, well, as I mentioned, we need to now know the side effect profile for BTK inhibitors and educate patients about those potential symptoms as well as the side effect profile for venetoclax. And both of these medications are oral. They're taken at home. They're usually um, delivered from a specialty pharmacy and they're very costly. So the CLL uh, society um, has financial assistance programs, and there's also other financial assistance programs um, that can be really helpful to help our patients afford these medications. And then um, education of the patient and caregivers and using the resources that we have um, so that patients are empowered um, to report any symptoms to us. So one um, of the really important resources that I wanted to point out was this education toolkit. And you can kind of see here uh, what is available. There's a lot of information about each targeted therapy. And we know that when we're educating patients, it's, it's very helpful and more effective if not only we're giving verbal education, but also written education that they can refer to later. I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, an investigational option for our double refractory patients, um, CAR T-cells. So with CAR T-cell therapy, we see a constellation of inflammatory symptoms re related to T-cell engagement and, and expansion. We can see cytokine release syndrome, neurologic toxicity, tumor lysis syndrome, B-cell aplasia, hypogabaglomulinemia, the mouthful, and cytopenias. <laughs> Um, the severity, related to, severity is usually related to disease burden and correlates with T-cell proliferation. It can be mild to severe, leading to multi-system organ failure, typically occurring 1 to 14 days after CAR T-cell infusion, and we'll often see an elevation in inflammatory markers with a massive elevation in IL-6. CRS, or cytokine release syndrome, presents with fever, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, headache, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, hypotension, capillary leak, coagulopathy, pulmonary edema, cardiac or renal dysfunction. So these patients can get quite sick. The goal is to prevent multi-system organ failure, but do not stop those CAR T cells from working. Treatment is supportive care. If the patient is decompensating, you'll try tocilizumab first, which is a monoclonal antibody to the IL-6 receptor, which blocks the IL-6 mediated inflammatory effects. And if the patient continues to decompensate, he'll then reach for steroids if they don't improve on the tocilizumab. We also see a lot of neurotoxicity and concurrent with cytokine release syndrome as well. This can present as confusion or delirium, expressive aphasia, seizures, patients can have tremors, 
decreased level of consciousness and hallucinations, encephalopathy, and difficulty finding words. Cause is unclear, but usually cytokine and T-cell mediated. Risk factors are unclear, but usually correlate with high disease burden and concurrent cytokine release syndrome. Treatment is supportive care and Keppra, and you usually have your, your, your neurology service following, following along with you while, you're, while they're inpatient, and sometimes outpatient as well. So I want to highlight a, a, a clinical trial, the Transcend CLL-004 study. These patients received anti-CD19 CAR with lysocell CAR T cells. Um, there was an 82% overall response rate in heavily pretreated patients, and the median progression-free survival was 13 months in patients progressing after both BTKI and venetoclax therapy. We did see some toxicity with, with these CAR T cells. 74% of patients experienced some form of cytokine release syndrome, but I want to highlight that uh, only 9% were grade 3 or higher. There was also some neurotoxicity patients saw. 39% of patients had some form of neurotoxicity, but only 22% had grade 3 or higher. So treatment with lysocell met its primary endpoint of complete response rate in patients with relapsed refractory CLL. And this is a potential option for patients, investigational option for patients who are double refractory with limited, with limited options for treatment. So we would, we would we'd like to refer you to the, back to the CLL Society. They have a lot of great information for you. They have a free CAR T-cell brochure for patients and healthcare providers. They explain CAR T-cell therapy to those with CLL in patient-friendly terms. They can be viewed as a digital flipbook online, and there's a free hard copy printed brochures that are available to have on hand in your office for distribution. You can just scan this QR code below. Okay. And then I'm going to kick it back to you, Laura. <laughs> okay. So now that we have gone through all of the data, I want to bring it back to Terry and... Um, He's going to share his experience on the role of nurses. Throughout my journey, nurses have been a major component of my treatment care. I must admit that I'm slightly biased here because my wife is a nurse. But more importantly, she recognized a serious condition that was not acknowledged by my first medical team. And because of that, she made me change doctors, which actually saved my life. I've also found that sometimes your best avenue of communication with your medical team is through the nursing staff. Whether it was the doctor's nurse, the clinical trial nurse, or the nurse doing the bone marrow biopsy on you. They have all provided exceptional patient care. For nurses in the audience, I would say that attending events like this are very important. They provide an opportunity for you to find out about the latest advancements in treatment learn from your expert colleagues, each other, and patients, and then use what you've learned to adapt to your practice to help patients with CLL like me. Okay, so now we're going to move into our cases, and I think we're going to be able to answer a lot of these questions as we go through um, the cases. So we're going to start with the first case. Um, Choosing upfront therapy. Uh, this is a, um, a case of a 73-year-old patient presenting with symptomatic, higher-risk um, CLL that has not yet been treated. There is a good performance status. The CLL um, ha is, has an unmutated IGHB and a TP53 mutation. So this is a high-risk situation and the comorbidities include renal insufficiency. So, um, so I'd like to engage Christina and Kristen in, um, and we'll start with Christina, how you would, um, how would you counsel this patient? What do you talk to them when they see these mutations and they know this is high risk and they're asking questions about it? Um, t tell us how, how you deal with that. Yeah, and you know we're well aware that sometimes um, nurses, this doesn't fall under nursing realm, and some nurses might be a little bit uncomfortable discussing these, but it's also really important to educate yourself on these because the patients, we know, they come to us with questions. Um, and so basically knowing unmutated IGHV and TP53 mutation, these are poor prognostic features. And so we don't want to sugarcoat anything for patients. We want to be upfront and honest with them. But the good thing is, what we can do is highlight the fact that therapy has improved so much over the past 10 years that now we've improved progression-free survival rates for patients with our novel agents. 
Um, and other than that, we would just help them through the course of treatment once they needed it. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, Chrissy's comments. I would just educate these patients that, um, you know, both BTK and venetoclax-based therapy provide excellent disease control for these higher risk, risk genomic features. Um, you know, and people have been able to have excellent disease control for many, many years to come. So um, there is really no wrong choice here, but, um, you know, we might favor continuous BTK suppression of the clone because we tend to see these patients have a little bit more of a durable remission than those with the venetoclax time-limited therapy and the higher-risk patient population. But again, venetoclax-based therapy is a totally, totally reasonable upfront option for this patient as well. Just have to be a little cautious with the renal insufficiency, which we can talk about in a bit. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and thanks for leading right into that. Like, so at, at the beginning when you're talking to patients and you're thinking about this, I, I think one thing you said that's really important is, um, is a lot of cl clinicians with older patients do favor starting with a continuous therapy, especially with higher risk disease, with this idea that continuous therapy could possibly keep them in remission longer. We don't have that data. And so a lot of this is, um, is basically experience and expert opinion. Um, but in our center, that plays a role in our choice as well. And then the other thing in this case is renal insufficiency. So that does concern me a little bit, especially when you're thinking about someone who doesn't have very good um, kidney function, they're 73 years old, and um, we don't have any other information, but if they had a high lymphocyte count or a really bulky lymphadenopathy, that would put them at higher risk of tumor lysis. So when you're talking to patients um, initially, are there any other things that come up in your discussion? Um, initially, just when counseling with BTK inhibitors, um, again, just the, I'll hide, highlight, you know, the excellent disease control, the convenience of it, when compared to this time-limited therapy, doesn't have as an extensive schedule. Um, the monitoring in the beginning, usually patients will come in about once a week, and in my practice is how we practice. We'll get, you know, weekly labs for the first month, and that's an opportunity for us, for at least our office practice nurse, or for me to check in with the patient and make sure there's no AEs that they're, that they're, that they're having, and we can help, you know, talk them through that. Um, and usually, you know, what we would just counsel them, even though the tumor lysis risk is very low in BTK inhibitors, usually we would start our patients on allopurinol just as a, just as a prophylaxis, um, usually for the, about the first month of therapy, just to make sure there isn't any signs of tumor lysis. Sometimes patients can have really bulky disease, and it's, we want to be overly cautious and protect those kidneys. Um, and just making it clear that, you know, new side effects should be reported promptly, Counseling them, counseling them on the bleeding risk, and um, and just being supportive and letting them know that you're there, and um, you know we're going to help them get through this. Yeah. Thank you. My practice is pretty similar too. Um, one thing I would add is I always make sure to talk to patients about hypertension every visit. So some of some patients that we have have been on BTK inhibitors for five, six, seven years. I mean, they're very effective and you can be on them for a long time. And we know that the risk of hypertension can um, continue throughout time. And when you're on a medication and you're doing well, like three years later, a, a patient who develops hypertension might not necessarily um, connect the two. And so I try to always bring that up in follow-up visits and have them monitor their home blood pressure and tell them that we would want to start blood pressure medication because there's really good data, actually, that if you treat the hypertension um, associated with the BTK inhibitors, it decreases the chance of having other cardiac problems, too. So it's really important to treat the blood pressure. Great. So do we cover everything, Christina, or do you have... I think so. I think um, at the practice I'm in, we do a lot of this very simple. We, we don't monitor as closely, I guess, with the BTKs. Um, so traditionally what we do, we'll start a BTK. One week later, we'll get some labs. Um, we'll review the labs with the patients. We might do a quick exam. These patients have rapid uh, shrinking of their lymph nodes and their spleen on these drugs. Um, so they feel almost an immediate response if they're bulky. Um, we'll just go through that. And then after that, we usually see them monthly and, and eventually stretch out to the three-month follow-up. So it's definitely not as daunting as a fixed duration. Rather. 
Okay, so let's move into the fixed duration regimen. <laughs> kind of talk about that. So uh, this patient's 59 years old, um, has a higher risk CLL that has not yet been treated, and there's a bulky lymphadenopathy. Excellent performance status. Uh, the IGHV is unmutated, and there's no significant comorbidities. Um, so through shared decision-making, if the decision is made to go to venetoclax or venetuzumab, um, what are the next steps? We can start with you, Christina. Okay. Uh, so next steps here are education, right? So we're going to start educating our patients on this because there's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about how often we give this regimen, how often they're going to have to come to the office, the possible side effects of both of these agents. Um, we're, um, we're also going to talk about logistics with family and making sure you get back and forth and drinking lots of water and starting prophylactic protective medications like antiviral medications, allopurinol, as we discussed before. So there's a lot of education that goes into the first steps, and there are a lot of steps in this process, but that's where I would suggest we start. Um, yes. Completely agree with you. Another way, another way our clinic would prepare from a medical perspective, um, I would want to get a really good tumor lysis risk assessment. There is tumor lysis risk. There is a tumor lysis risk seen with when you're giving obinutuzumab and both and both, both venetoclax. And sometimes pa patients don't have superficial palpable nodes. They can be smaller, and then you'll scan them, and they're hiding like a 14 centimeter conglomerate in their abdomen of, you know, of lymph nodes. So you need to find that. And if you're dealing with something like that, that might alter the way you monitor the patient. You might even consider hospitalizing them for the first infusion of obinutuzumab in order to, for more frequent monitoring, more IV hydration, and it's just safer. Um, so we'd want to get that, you know, assess their, their risk for tumor lysis. It's very important. Um, again, you want to make them aware of the potential of infusion reactions with obinutuzumab. About over 60% of patients will have some form of infusion reaction. Um, these patients should be prepared for that, especially on day one is their highest risk for developing an infusion reaction. I always counsel patients that, you know, um, it's a split dose. You give 100 milligrams on day one and 900 milligrams on day two. I said, you know, if you can take the week off for at least a few days, you, it's exhausting. They're there long, long, like the majority of the day they're there, hours and hours. Um, and they're gonna and they're and they're gonna be exhausted. They're getting you know high dose steroids. They're getting Benadryl. Um, you know they're having they potentially have fevers and feel quite unwell. So just kind of setting them up for what that first the first couple of weeks look like, but and letting them know it's it's not forever. It's manageable once you get through that. That could, that's the most difficult part of this process. And then we hope we hope that it'll pay off in the end, and they can potentially come off therapy and have a durable treatment free observation. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's our experience too. And it's really amazing. Even after that first dose of obinutuzumab, where you're only giving 100 milligrams out of the 1,000 milligram dose, you can see a rapid response. Um, the patient I treated this week, the white blood cell count went from 60 to 5 with just that very first one. So it's very effective as cytoreducing. And I think that is um, important to know because you're doing the tumor lysis risk assessment before you start abinutuzumab, and you're not starting venetoclax until day 22. So they've already had several doses. So by the time you start venetoclax, you want to reassess the um, risk of tumor lysis because they might very well be low risk at that point. I also wanted to stress something that I should have mentioned before, but these patients, so this, this regimen, the sixth duration regimen, is based on the CL CLL14 study, um, and it is very intensive. And I think up front it's important to let patients know that if they do not follow that regimen to a T, it's okay, um, and that how it's done is based on how they're responding. So as Laura said, someone whose white blood cell count drops from 60 to 5, they might now be neutropenic, or they might be thrombocytopenic. You might actually have to hold day 8 of obinutuzumab or day 15, and that's all okay, um, you don't want to let these patients feel like because of their initial response that they're off, you know, they're not following the trial correctly and something's wrong. So it's, you have to be really versatile in managing them. I can't remember the last time we started venetoclax on day 22. I'll be honest. I'm just happy when I can get them through obinutuzumab comfortably because it's a really, really intense drug. Yeah. But fortunately, it's only given for six cycles. And then the last, um, you know, six cycles of this treatment they're on oral venetoclax, and it becomes less intense, and there are fewer visits. 
So I'm curious how you manage um, monitoring as an outpatient, like, because uh, you probably have patients that don't live close to your center. So how do you, if they're outpatient, get the labs the day before, have them take their venetoclax, and then get labs six hours after that and 24 hours after that as an outpatient? <laughs> Um, so what we do is um, the patient, we do the labs, the patient comes to the clinic, they start their drug. We obviously have to wait to test, to check for tumor lysis 68 um, hours later. We actually automatically usually give them some fluids. They're there, they're waiting around. If they're not local, they can't just go home and come back. So we just give them some fluids. Um, we check their labs. We have them come back to the center the next day for repeat labs and, and possible hydration again if there's any tumor lysis noted. I do want to highlight, um, it's important to do this if you're doing this in an outpatient center. You need real lab time results. You can't have a like six hour lab delay because if there is signs of tumor lysis, it's an oncologic emergency and it has to be dealt with immediately. So it's really important that you know, outpatient centers have that ability to have that quick lab, laboratory turnaround um, in order to do this regimen outpatient safely. Um, otherwise you might want to consider admitting the patient at least for the first two weeks. Um, of, the, of the dose ramp up as well, and obinutuzumab. Um, but yes, we, we do the same thing basically like Chrissy. We bring patients in first appointment of the day. They're usually there except for 7 a.m. labs. You want to see those labs. You want to make sure there's no abnormalities, um, you know, because um, you have to correct any pre-existing lab abnormality before you dose with venetoclax. And then, you, you know, as soon as they dose, then you start that timer, and you can repeat six hours later. I have pa patients come into my practice. They have coolers. They pack for the day. They're, you know, they have a, they're they're going to work upstairs in our infusion center. Like, you know, you prepare them, um, and you know, you tell them it's like it's a lot of work up front. But then, you know, after eight weeks of you know busy visits, um, you know, we're, we're we're you know our goal is to get you to an undetectable remission um, or un have undetectable disease, and um, hopefully come off therapy for you know many years to come. So. It's uh, you know, you have to kind of tell them it's worth the it's worth the work of up front if they're willing to do it. Um, one thing I would add to that is we do the same thing, but with low risk patients, what I've started doing, especially with people that live far away, is getting labs at like Quest or LabCorp the day before, and then telling them to take their venetoclax in the morning, and then they see me like in an afternoon appointment, and then if they need anything, I can. I can order that in the infusion center. But the next day, usually I, ha I have them come back to the center because as you pointed out, I need those labs in real time. And if they're getting it locally and they need something, then they're not close by. But that's helped a little bit with low risk patients in terms of decreasing the clinic time. Um, and then how would this change if, if a novel venetoclax and abrutinib option was used? Um, this is not standard of care yet. This has not been approved, but we talked about how you would do the abrutinib. Um, you would start abrutinib first for the first three cycles, and that helps decrease the risk of tumor lysis. Okay, so just to recap, we're going to be educating patients on the dosing schedule, um, the risk of infusion reactions, perform tumor lysis risk assessment uh, before they start therapy, and before they start obinutuzumab and um, again before they start the venetoclax ramp up. Um, and then similar counseling if venetoclax and abrutinib is used. So let's talk a little bit about um, adverse event management. So this is a 70 year old with symptomatic CLL and significant comorbidities um, with an unmutated, the CLL has an unmutated um, IGHV and TP3 mutation. And um, this patient is being treated up front with a covalent um, BTK inhibitor. So uh, we, we don't specifically specify which one, but remember the covalent BTK inhibitors are brutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, which are the three currently approved ones. Um, so one of the important things to counsel patients on is lymphocytosis. And Kristen, can you tell us what I mean by that? Yes, I call it like a redistribution. Um, so the mechanism of action, the way these covalent PTK inhibitors work is they push the lymphocytes out of the spleen, out of the bone marrow, out of the lymph nodes, and now they circulate around in the blood. So if the patient comes in after say a week or two on their covalent PTK inhibitor and their white count has doubled, the patient almost faints because they think they're rapidly progressing. And you have to reassure them, they're like, no, 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 it's working. 
okay? Because eventually these lymphocytes will, will circulate out and the body will break them down and, and, and the white blood cell count will normalize and lymphocyte count will normalize. Depending on the burden of the of disease, I had a lady who had a 300,000 white count and she went up to five or 600,000 with this redistribution. And we were like, whoa. Um, but it took her a couple of months to kind of normalize her counts. Um, and this is very common, what we see in, in BTK inhibitors. And, I, you know, and patients should be warned because um, it's very distressing for them to think, oh my God, I've started a new medication and I'm just, I'm just, my disease is exploding. Um, so that's really important. You should just reassure them. That's a good sign. It's positive. It means it's working. Thank you. The other thing I would add to patients with the white count so elevated is the risk of a pseudo hyperkalemia. So when you have a patient whose white blood cell count is 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, and you draw blood, all those cells are fragile and they break in the tube and they release potassium. And so you get that emergency call that the potassium 6.8, but it's actually not. And you just need to do a VBG or whole blood potassium to get the, the real potassium level. That happens a lot. A lot of times if I have a patient coming in with a really wide high count, I'll just, it, in my institution, it's serum potassium. I'll just double both. I'll, I'll order both. And I'm like, don't cancel. Um, so it'll just save the, the patient, you know, because sometimes initially, depending on how, how high it is, I'll repeat it. I don't like to, but if you just get a serum potassium on top of that comprehensive or basic metabolic, they'll run both and you'll see, um, and it's a little bit more accurate. So yeah. it yeah. can be distressing. <laughs> well, especially when you're monitoring for tumor lysis. Yeah. 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 Um, so when your patients are on um, BTK inhibitors, how do you uh, counsel them, Christina, like when they're preparing for a procedure? Yeah, so when you're, um, when you're educating your patients before they start a BTK inhibitor, you're obviously going to review the risk of bleeding. And one of the key things is if you're going to have any invasive procedures, we need to know about it because we need to guide you in when you should hold your drug and when you should restart because we don't want to put them at unnecessary risk for bleeding. So there are some guidelines in the prescribing information, but generally speaking, anywhere between three and seven days before and three and seven days after based on, the, on what the procedure is. So... You know, if you're having um, something like a biopsy that might, or a dental extraction, that might be two or three days. But if you're having like, you know, a hip replacement or an amputation, that would be more extensive, right? So you'd hold the drug for a longer period of time. Thank you. Now, one of the big things we see with BTK inhibitors is arthralgias. It's actually one of the most common um, reasons for discontinuation of, of these medications. Um, Kristen, this is a hard one to treat. How do you approach treating the arthralgias? Um, it's a pain in the butt. So you start your patient on a new BTK inhibitor. And um, what I've seen professionally is um, it tends to be worse in the first couple of months um, of starting, usually for first month or two, um, particularly. So you have to do a lot of reassuring. Um, and you want to treat them supportively. You want to, you know, you can tell them heat, um, if their platelets are okay, um, you know, they can try some NSAIDs within reason, Tylenol. Um, but if it really persists and it's impacting their activities of daily living, um, a lot of times what's helped is a brief hold. You know, we don't like to do this too early in therapy, but sometimes just two to three days resets the patient. And when you restart, it's a little bit more tolerable. Um, I've even, uh, in our practice, I've even prescribed a short course of corticosteroids, at, you know, three days of prednisone, that also has been really helpful with this, with this patient population. If it really persists and it's, you know, all these interventions aren't working, you might want to consider, you know, switching to a second generation BTK inhibitor if you're not there already. But if you're, if they're on a second generation, perhaps trying another one. But usually we try, if it's like the first month of therapy, you kind of just talk the patient through it, try and get them through a month or two and see if there's any improvement and go from there. Yeah, I agree with that. And it, it is, it's always surprising to me when um, just holding it for a couple of days makes a big difference. Um, but ultimately, if it's been months, it's, this is something that's really hard to live with. It's really hard. Patients will end up like not taking their pills or, um, you know, holding certain doses and things like that. And so changing to a different um, medication can really help if, if they have these arthralgias, and sometimes changing it is enough to um, resolve it. I also want to add one more thing. I see a lot of muscle cramping, um, specifically with a brute nib. We'll have a patient who's doing beautifully on a brute nib for five plus years. 
they'll have muscle cramping, like Charlie horses in the middle of the night. Um, and sometimes just adding a simple magnesium supplement or a vitamin B complex um, has really helped these patients and um, has um, kind of like made, improved their quality of life. So obviously you wanna check a magnesium level to make sure that they're not already elevated or toxic, but if it's within reason, a little over-the-counter magnesium has uh, done a lot for this patient population. So that yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Um, and then what about, Christina, did you wanna talk, well, you already mentioned something about the headaches on a calibrutinib, but I'm curious, um, are you seeing this only at the start of treatment, or are you seeing headaches occur later on after they've been on therapy for several years? No, we're really seeing them up front, uh, usually in the first one to two months of therapy. Um, they are super frustrating for the patients, um, and so, you know, you just keep encouraging them. Um, again, as I said earlier, I've never seen anyone stop a calibrutinib because of the headaches. We tell them to take some Tylenol, we tell them to take caffeine. If they, if they don't drink coffee, you tell them there's caffeine pills available. And usually that helps. Um, they're, they're very responsive to these. Uh, the only thing I can say is that, you know, for some reason, if you are growing concerned about headaches and there are other comorbidities around and you feel that further evaluation needs to be done, don't assume automatically that it is only the Xanamert, I'm sorry, the Acalabrutinib. Great, thanks. Um, now, we know that neutropenia is one of the um, major side effects we look for with xanabrutinib. The rate of neutropenia is a little bit higher than that. And um, we all have a little bit of a different practice. Um, and I think a lot of it depends on the patient, how we approach. So, Kristen, what do you do with, um, how do you manage neutropenia with xanabrutinib? Yeah, in, my, in our practice, are a little aggressive with the growth factor. Once you start to see that you know, neutrophil count really start to drift um, close to one or even below one, we'll start giving uh, you know neupogen injections and support them through it. Um, if it's really you know if it's really significant grade three, um, we consider a dose hold and let, give neupogen support and have a short interval recheck. And usually they pop right up and then restart them and see how they do. Um, but if they have persistent neutropenia, despite your efforts, you might even want to consider a dose reduction. But we try and avoid that as much as possible, even if, specifically if they're kind of early into their course, if they've just started drug, you want to get them, you want to try and get that full dose in as much as possible. Yeah, we do something really similar. Um, at the first occurrence, we would probably hold it and give growth factor and then restart it. And if it continued to happen, again, we, we're very aggressive with growth factor two. We give it for an A and C less than one and, um, and try as hard as we can to keep it the, it at the, um, uh, the standard dose. Yeah. You do the same? Same. Okay. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, do you preferentially do 160 milligrams twice a day of Xanabrutinib or the once daily? We were talking about we, this on the plane we, yesterday. We have difference. So <laughs> I'm almost, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that, you know, taking four pills at one time of the day is actually the same as taking two pills twice a day. In the practice I'm in, we are generally doing two pills twice a day. Um, these are kind of large capsules. Um, and if we don't sense a problem with compliance or we don't experience a problem with compliance, that's the way we prefer to go. I know Kristen does it differently. We like daily dosing. Um, yeah, we prefer daily dosing on our patients um, because I feel like that is the one, one of the issues we do see with acalabrutinib, that BID dosing. People forget, you know, they're like, you know, and it's really, um, you know, and that's the, you know, we tend to favor Xanu for older patients, you know, because of the daily dosing um, over acalabrutinib. So, um, yep. It's really, it's really practice specific. So. It is. And from a nursing perspective, it's so much easier. Like we know that for compliance issues, you should try to make it as simple as possible. And once a day dosing is so much easier. So I love that about um, that it's a possibility, but I actually agree with Christina. We, we tend to do 160 milligrams twice a day um, with the idea that it's going to be better tolerated and possibly provide um, a more constant level of inhibition yeah. in the blood. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about how it's important to educate patients that lymphocytosis is normal and expected with BTK uh, therapy and how important it is 
for them to let us know if they're going to have a procedure so we can counsel them on holding uh, the BTK inhibitor before and after the procedure. Um, the arthralgias um, on abrutinib we manage with dose holds, uh, modifications, supportive care, um, and then ultimately uh, switching to a more selective BTK inhibitor if none of these interventions are effective. Um, the headaches on a calibrutinib are, are pretty self-limited. Um, they're more common right at the beginning and can be managed with Tylenol and caffeine. And we talked about doing dose modifications and using growth factor support for uh, neutropenia on xanabrutinib. All right, our last case that we want to talk about today is um, preparing for sequential therapy um, in double exposed disease. Um, so that means a disease that has been previously treated with a BTK inhibitor and a um, venetoclax-based regimen. So this is an older patient with CLL who, whose CLL relapsed um, to, after an upfront venetoclax-based regimen and then uh, was treated with a covalent BTK inhibitor and there's disease progression. Uh, the CLL has an unmutated I IGHV, uh, but no TP350, no TP53 mutation. Okay, so Kristen, what are the options for this patient? So the first thing I'm going to ask is, um, how long was his remission after the venetoclax-based therapy, that time-limited therapy? If he got a remission longer than two years after he, you know, after he stopped that venetoclax-based therapy we would have the option of restarting venetoclax again as there would be a, a significant chance he would have response to it. If he relapsed within 24 months of him stopping venetoclax, um, he's probably refractory to it or resistant to it, and I would take that, that option off the table. And at that point, I would tell him, you know, your standard of care options are suboptimal. Uh, they, you know, like I, like I said before, the, the, the remissions are not durable with the, like the PI3K inhibitors and we know that these, we know patients don't particularly respond well to um, chemotherapy with un unmutated IGHV. So I would get him, if he's not already, at, to an academic center who has clinical trials available. I'd first refer him to the CLL Society website to kind of scan what, what, are, what, what open trials are around him and then refer him, to, refer him to an academic center for a consult and to figure out what treatment options are available in the clinical trial setting. That would be the steps I would take. Thanks. That's a really important point about um, when the progression occurs. And it is, it, in our practice, it, it, we have a similar approach where that two years is sort of like an important time mark on whether or not it's going to be effective to retreat with the same agent. Um, and I'm really glad that you pointed out about clinical trials because there are so many really good clinical trials that are available to patients that um, are open for accrual right now. Um, now, we think that pertubrutinib, which was just approved, uh, is a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, and it was just approved in mantle cell lymphoma. We think it's going to be approved very soon for CLL, and I know both of you have some experience with that. Um, so are there any practical aspects, um, Christina, that you want to share with us? Uh, you just have to remember that pertubertinib is still a BTK inhibitor, right? So you still have to consider the same side effect profile. Even though it's a more selective drug and it has a better side effect profile, you still have to educate on all of this. Um, if the patient is receiving this on a clinical trial, it really depends on the institution you work at, if there's a, a solid research team that steps in and kind of takes initiative here, or if you as the nurse are involved with these research patients. But you have to actually educate these patients that as much as we market the BTK inhibitors in general as maybe more gentler therapy, uh, less daunting, once you're on a clinical trial, it's, it's very regimented. Um, there are certain times you have to return to the office, certain labs you need, certain periods where you're going to need scans, you might need a bone marrow or you know, retesting flow cytometry. So you kind of have to let the patients know that this did just become a little more intensive because you are on a clinical trial. Anything to add, Kristen? Uh, no, I, I think you covered it, covered it all. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for it to come to market. 
<laughs> I think it's going to fill a huge unmet need. And I think a lot of people are kind of waiting with bated breath for this approval, which is hopefully coming sooner than later. So, because there's a lot of patients who would benefit from this drug. Yeah, we are waiting with bated breath because right now there are three BTK inhibitors and if patients don't tolerate one, we can switch to another. So we have a lot of options, but once um, the disease progresses, you can't switch to another one because it's not gonna work. And pertbrutinib is unique in the fact that it works even for um, CLL that's previously been resistant to the covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, so Kristen, if you decide to retreat with venetoclax because this relapse happened five years after their last therapy, um, how would you approach retreating with venetoclax? Well, would if you start at the full dose or would you do a ramp up uh, again? It, like, <laughs> we would never make this easy, why would we? No, we have to restart that whole five week ramp up all over again and it has to be explained to the patient. We don't want him taking his, hopefully he wouldn't have any at home, but an old bottle of a 400 milligram dose because we need to start that slow ramp up at 20 over the five week, you know, course. And with the tumor lysis monitoring, like we're starting from scratch. Um, if they've had, you know, if, he, if he's, if he meets the IWCLL criteria for clinical progression, that's what you have to do. Um, and depending on the physician you're working with, they may choose to just use venetoclax monotherapy or add a, um, you know, an antibody to it, like an anti-CD20. Um, so that's a conversation with the physician about the treatment path that you'd want to do for the patient. Okay. So, um, oh, so just to recap, um, clinical trials are always an option for patients. Off-label um, non-covalent BTK inhibitors also an option. Um, make sure to check out the tools available at the CLL Society. And um, with all of these therapies, it's really important to um, monitor for adverse events. Um, retreatment with venetoclax can be considered, though the timing of progression is a factor. And if venetoclax retreatment is chosen, um, there are similar tumor lysis prevention pr uh, principles that apply. So the take homes for today is that the modern targeted platforms for CLL have really changed the landscape and resulted in prolonged overall survival and prolonged progression-free survival and possibly time off therapy. Um, so either using continuous oral therapy with BTK inhibitors or using the um, time-defined um, venetoclax platforms are well-established standards of care and either one of those are appropriate standard of care for first-line treatment or relapsed, um, a treatment of relapsed disease. So be prepared to engage in shared decision-making with your patients um, and help them understand the effectiveness, the logistics, and the safety profile of these different regimens. Um, and please um, do refer to the CLL Society resources, which have so many useful tools to share with patients. So unfortunately, with CLL, it invariably relapses, and most patients will be exposed to both a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, but there are new treatment options on the horizon with different mechanisms of actions that will help prolong survival in patients. And for us, it is very important to continue to provide um, education to patients, know, uh, teach them and empower them to report um, any symptoms, promptly manage um, side effects. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, we have hit the limit for, um, for the time for this, but we do wanna take questions for about five minutes. We had so many questions come in here, oh my goodness, but I feel like we answered um, many of them already. So I'm gonna scroll through here and see which ones we haven't. Um, okay, do you, so your patients who have high blood pressure, do you guys consult cardiology and have the cardiologist manage their blood pressure or do you manage it? We usually refer to either their primary care provider or cardiology to start and manage their antihypertensives. 
Agree. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that they have a, a primary care doctor, or at least, you know, before starting therapy or their cardiologist, that they're plugged in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we prefer that they, they, they help, they assist with us. Yeah. yeah. I think another important teaching point is like when patients come off of BTK inhibitor, then you need to monitor them and their blood pressure because you need to start, often you can taper their antihypertensives because their blood pressure gets better. Um, so one of the questions is, should we be advocating that patients get early prognostic testing, and do you retest at progression? Yeah. Christina. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, uh, we kind of touched upon this in the program, but, um, you know, oncologists do this in different ways. Um, you know, in our major medical centers, we test for this stuff at diagnosis. There's, um, there's some physicians who feel there's no need to test for this until right before you're going to actually initiate treatment. That can be frustrating. We actually prefer to test at diagnosis. That way we can risk stratify your disease. We kind of know our, we have a plan in our head for how we're going to treat you, and not just first line, but second line and beyond, based on what we already know. Um, I think the second part of that question was, there was a second part to the question. Um, oh, uh, yes, after. Good. Yes. And after every therapy, we would retest. Um, we would retest cytogenetics. We'd look at FISH and uh, TP53 mutation because that can change in the course of therapy. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question about if there's a preferred agent or category of medications for hypertension management. And that answer is um, no. Any antihypertensive can work, and you basically choose it based on the other, um, like, other uh, comorbidities um, for that patient. Um, we had a question, what is FCR? And um, I love that someone's asking that question because FCR is so rarely <laughs> used anymore, um, which is, hopefully I'm going to get it right, flubidarabine, um, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. Yeah. And um, that was a standard of care for many years uh, for uh, CLL. There's a question about using um, epoetin alpha to correct hemoglobin caused by high CLL cells in the bone marrow and postpone the treatment um, that way. No, I, I've never, you know, the problem is not, you, you have to target the issue, and the issue is your CLL cells are crowding out your bone marrow, and you need to clear out those cells. So I would not use, I've never used, I've never used darbopoietin for that. Um, if, if the patients are having signs and symptoms of anemia and their you know, hemoglobin is consistently below 10 um, and, you know, um, and downtrending even more, then it's time to start, you know, strongly consider starting CLL therapy. Um, and then you'll see in, in time, you know, as those CLL cells are cleared out of the marrow, their hemoglobin will rise. Also, too, if you have a, if you have a drifting hemoglobin, you, um, patients can also have autoimmune complications from CLL. You want to work them up for autoimmune hemolytic anemia which is another uh, bunch of lab tests you'd want to run as well. I think that's a really important point, is making sure autoimmune um, hemolytic anemia is very, is relatively common with CLL, one of the known complications, and I agree, it's important to do that workup for anyone who has anemia. But with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, like the great interaction, and please enjoy the rest of your day in the conference. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash AZG860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Lilly, Pharmacyclics LLC and AbbVie Company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC.